Welcome, everybody, to today's Australian Water Schools webinar, Harnessing Nature for Wastewater. My name is Jacqueline Fritzenschaff. I'm the General Manager um, Research Services for uh, Water Research Australia, and I'm very honored to chair today's webinar for you. So uh, today's uh, experts are showing up here on the screen, and I would like to have everybody briefly put uh, their, uh, you know, their video on and talk about, uh, tell, tell us who they are uh, and what their passion is and why they're here. So um, I'll start with Ben. I'm coming. Yeah. Good morning or hello from uh, the Rumble country. Uh, which is based in central Queensland on the Fitzroy River Basin. So, yeah, I I'm passionate about uh, all forms of on-site and decentralised systems, and I'm incredibly excited to be talking to you today. I absolutely love lecturing, so hello to everybody who's watching live, but also hello to those who, because of time zones and work commitments, are watching the recordings. Um, yeah, if you are watching the recording or if you think of a question after you've watched it live, if you flick it to me, I will answer it even after the webinar. So, uh, yes, I hope you enjoy today's presentation and we keep you all engaged. Thank you, Ben. I'll hand over to Dendra. Well, uh, hello and um, to your help. <laughs> <laughs> my, my passion for... Uh, wastewater is basically what our organization theme is that water is water and not waste we always make the point that uh, when we talk about disposal where exactly does it go um, it isn't disposal anymore it's dispersal and anybody that's drinking their coffee or their glass of water right now just consider how many eons of geology and various internal organs of dinosaurs that has gone through before it gets to you. Uh, that's my passion is to instill that respect for the water resources and the recycling of it. Thank you, Dendra. What a good point. Um, so this is a, a great lead into uh, water and wastewater in general. <laughs> so how we should look at uh, the resource in, in general. Natalie, would you like to go next? Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm an environmental scientist. I specialize in freshwater management. Um, and the reason I have this interest is I've worked a lot in some industries that have produced a lot of wastewater uh, and their motivation to treat it is not very high. So working with a company like Aris, where we're using, you know, environmentally friendly systems, you know, most the best way we can do it to get that water back to you know the, the amazing fresh water and clean water that we have as much as we can. Thank you very much, Natalie. So Richard um, is next. Richard, you go. Hello, everybody. My name is Richard. I've worked with Ben in the Aris team uh, involved with the wastewater industry for about 12 years. Um, we do a lot of projects all over Australia, which we're involved in both the domestic and larger commercial systems. I have a passion for wastewater. I've uh, been involved a, a long time, so happy to help with any questions. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and thank you to the um, to the panel members and the speakers. And I think um, I'll just have the pre-webinar uh, results popped up. And uh, Ben, if you would like to talk to them as you see them, that would be great. Always happy to talk. We appear to have a lot of consulting people here today. Um, we've got some. A, a, a few academics, a lot of regulators, people in, in government and planning, some water utilities. Uh, as I've been flicking through the participants' names, I've uh, noticed quite a few uh, colleagues who I'm sure will give me passive aggressive uh, critiques afterwards <laughs> on how the webinar went and, and uh, what went well and what didn't. But the um, yeah, it's a really broad range of people and excitingly, uh, people from all over the world. So we should be able to get a uh, great deal of interesting questions at the end of the webinar. And uh, please feel free to write your questions throughout the course of the webinar. Um, the team will be looking through and, and you can uh, vote on questions that are asked. And uh, I try to be as responsive to them as possible. So we'll get to as many as we can. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ben. And yes, we definitely have a very international crowd here today that stretches from Africa, uh, Kenya, I've seen all the way uh, to India and Pakistan and uh, and Europe, so and of course Australia. Uh, so this is great. Um, so without uh, further ado, I think we will start the presentation. And while uh, Ben is uh, diving into his presentation and uh, will share his slides, uh, uh, please feel free to just keep your questions in the chat and the likes and I will just uh, for men's benefit turn my camera on, back on when the time's up about two minutes before we launch into Q&A. Um, thank you very much and over to you Ben. Well welcome to the presentation we're talking about harnessing nature for wastewater or basically passive and low input wastewater treatment systems. So, so a passive wastewater system as a non-mechanical method of treatment typically needs no electricity to operate. And, but, you know, running everything via gravity can be quite difficult. So closely related to a passive wastewater system as a low input wastewater system. And this has minimal mechanical processes. Typically, it just involves the pumps required to move water through the treatment system because some locations and sites, um, just being able to run everything with no pumps um, is very hard, next to impossible. Both passive and low impact systems typically mimic natural processes. So we are really trying to harness the power of nature here. Um, and treatment systems such as constructed wetlands, depending on your site, your location, yeah, they can be either passive or, or low input. It really does vary. So a lot of the different treatment systems that I'm going to be discussing today, and we discuss in the, the panel session afterwards, they can be either passive or low input, depending on how they're installed. So why choose passive or low input systems? Now, um, some people who work in this area, all they do is install a, a passive or a low input system. Uh, I suppose I'm a little bit weird that, uh, while I use a lot of these technologies and everything that we're talking about today, I, I will have installed or designed somewhere. I also use a lot of mechanical systems. So not every site that I've got, is it possible to actually install a passive or a long input system? And that's what I mean here by this very first thing that you've got to, uh, as a designer, your first thing to ensure is what you're proposing is fit for purpose. Will it actually work? Now this picture on the, the right here, I'll use the laser pointer. Yeah, that's actually a mechanical system. It's a Fuji clean system. Uh, they're used all over the world. Why have I got this here? I've installed plenty of these in sites which have really small footprints. And you can see that it's a mechanical system because it's got blowers, it's got pumps, there's lots of things which are moving around. But what the blower and all the mechanics of this system does, it shrinks the system down. If I was going to do this in a passive or a low input way, typically I'd need a much larger area. And some sites you don't have that. So if you're choosing a passive or low input system, it's got to be fit for purpose for the site that you've got. Um, they go very well in areas where there's no or minimal electric power. If you're chasing low greenhouse gas emissions, this is the, the technologies which are good for you. If you've got a problem, with operational costs. If you need to keep them low, you don't have a very large maintenance budget. If you're struggling for skilled staff, and there's been plenty of questions come through prior to the webinar from people registering, are these passive and low input systems suitable for remote locations, developing locations? Yes, and one of the major reasons why they are is that they can be maintained for a lower cost with people with a lower skill set. And uh, the passive and low input systems tend to be a lot more robust and reliable. There's a lot less things that can go wrong. And because they're larger, they're also resistant to hydraulic surges or peak flows coming through your treatment system. And yeah, depending on how you design them, how you install them, whether you put them together in a treatment chain, you can actually get a high level of treatment. There is a perception that because you're talking about passive or low input systems, that only primary treatment or basic treatment is possible, where you can actually go for, for quite high levels of treatment. 
So what types of passive and low input systems are there? There are many, right? So anaerobic treatment, soil-based treatment systems, plant-based treatment systems, such as evapotranspiration systems, constructed wetlands, sand filters, both single paths and recirculating, mounds. Now, quite often around the world, they're called Wisconsin mounds, although I have found out that in the United States, they typically just call them mounds because uh, naming a treatment system after a, another state is just as popular, I suppose, if here in Australia, we could design something called a, the Queensland treatment system and then tried to use it in Victoria. Wood chip filters, media and fabric filters. So media, things like volcanic rocks, biochar, fabric filters, uh, Aranko out of Oregon in the United States use an awful lot of these. Dosing siphons and flouts. This is a, a method of uh, dosing water without having to use pumps. Venturi aeration, such as Maisy Venturi aerators, flow plus chemical blocks like the clear flow group. And none of these um, treatment techniques need to just be used individually. You can put together a treatment chain. So you can have an anaerobic treatment leading into a soil based system or into a sand filter or into a wood chip filter. So just like in a mechanical treatment process or a municipal treatment plant, you can actually design up treatment chains using passive and low input systems. So who uses passive and low input systems? They are used all around the world and the popularity has changed over time. Now, I've been in the water industry now for the best part of three decades. I was just thinking with the profile picture that was at the start of this webinar, I've got to get one which has got more of the gray hair put in there. That's a far too young a photo. But when I started out, um, mechanical systems, were all the rage, uh, very popular. And these passive and low input systems were nowhere near as popular as what they are today. They've actually increased in popularity over the last 30 years. And part of that has got to do that there was a, a, a viewpoint that the mechanical systems meant more advanced treatment, um, that the passive and low input systems, some of them are decades old, some of them are over a century old. And, a new machine, a new package treatment plant was thought to be more advanced. But where we've assessed these mechanical systems and their performance over time, that's changed that viewpoint. Because what we've worked out is that the maintenance of these systems is quite often not kept up of, of the mechanical systems. And that these passive and low input systems actually produce a much higher water quality more consistently over time for a lower cost. And in the last 10, 15 years, greenhouse gases, carbon emissions, sustainability has become a, a, a lot more of a focus. And this conference, which I've got uh, advertised over here on the right hand side, is uh, in Greece later on this year. And it's basically talking about constructed wetlands and these passive and low input systems going into closed cycles and the circular economy and ecological engineering. Now, yeah, 30 years ago when I started out in this industry, this conference wouldn't be talking about this particular uh, types of technology. But in the last 10 years, they've been increasing in popularity and forging ahead. Scalability. Um, yeah. What's the applicability of these passive and low input systems? Um, they can go on a single household. So that's where we start talking about on site systems, single lot. Uh, but they can also go up to municipal sizes. So yes, they can treat cities. Um, my company's got a sand filter system and a, a soil based uh, treatment system going in at the moment for uh, a wastewater treatment uh, facility, which is 250,000 litres a day, which is you know a, a reasonable size. If you're going to a big city, those larger volumes, the, the footprint, can actually be a limiting factor. So, and the costs of acquiring the land can make some forms of passive treatment, such as your bigger sand filters, uh, uneconomic. So if those capital costs start to be a, a limiting factor, some forms of passive and low input treatment technologies start to become a lot more attractive. And these, this is where constructed wetlands really come into their own. 
they're much more scalable than things such as uh, sand filters, soil-based treatment systems. And Europe has been doing these larger constructed wetlands and exporting their ideas around the world. So EcoBirds, one place which has been doing it, UFS, uh, EcoBirds out of France, UFZ, that's out of Germany. Um, so a lot of small towns, villages, what the rest of the world probably calls decentralized systems have uh, been constructed in Europe using these larger constructed wetlands. Now they have exported this technology all over the world, lots of installations in the Middle East, lots of installations in Africa, the subcontinent and Southeast Asia. And one of the major reasons for that is that with a constructed wetland, it's a form of passive or low input wastewater treatment system where you don't need to bring a lot of materials to site to construct it. Um, so that makes it the capital cost a, a lot more effective. In Australia, constructed wetlands are also being used for larger projects. Uh, two of the leading proponents in Australia is the Water and Carbon Group and uh, Wet Systems with uh, Dr. Thomas Headley. So yeah, have a look at the websites, have a look at the case studies which are there. There's lots of interesting things being done uh, with constructed wetlands at a larger scale. Water quality. Primary, secondary and tertiary water quality are all achievable with passive and low input wastewater systems. But you might not be able to get them just with the one technology on its own, that you may need to be able to put together a treatment chain. Disinfection can actually be complicated. If we think about the previous slide, I was talking about constructed wetlands. Disinfecting the human bacteria can be relatively easy through a constructed wetland if you've got the retention time right. Uh, but depending on whether you're going a subsurface flow wetland or a surface flow wetland, you'll actually have a lot of wildlife enter into that particular treatment technology, ducks, fish, eels. Uh, I was doing some work in a constructed wetland um, a few years ago and uh, maintenance work going in to repair a pipe and I stepped on an eel and it wrapped itself around my leg and I may have actually increased the amount of fecal coliforms that were there in that uh, uh, constructed wetland because I wasn't expecting the eel. But if you get that natural system, those types of uh, animals and the wildlife, they'll start excreting into the water themselves, right? So you'll end up with uh, fecal coliform count, not related to the human wastewater that went through there, but from the natural system that you're actually putting there, right? So disinfection becomes complicated with some of these techniques. Now I received a question um, prior to the webinar from somebody who registered about the depth of clay soil required to disinfect uh, wastewater before it gets to an underground aquifer. And there's no simple answer to that question because it really depends on how the water is applied to that clay soil. So if it's uh, applied um, intermittently and evenly across the clay soil, you get a very different answer to that question compared to if it's just gravity dosed into that clay soil and uh, there's no wetting and drying cycle. So I'll go into that in a little bit more uh, on some of these additional slides. So yeah, depending on what you're trying to achieve, you may need treatment chains to get primary, secondary or tertiary water quality out of your passive and low input systems. And yeah, the system design is very important. I can't sit here and tell you that a sand filter will produce always secondary treatment systems, uh, uh, secondary treated water quality, sorry, because it depends on how that sand filter is designed. And uh, something that a lot of people forget is that passive and low input treatment techniques yeah, they can be poorly designed and fail just like any other water treatment technology. These are, are not a magic bullet. Um, you've really got to think about the design and the performance is closely linked to the size, materials, distribution of water. I would like to say that over 30 years I've, uh, I've been installing these things, I've never made a mistake, but I've made plenty and I've learned from them and adjusted my techniques and a good part of what our company does is we don't just design and install these things, we operate and maintain them. So we're coming back five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, 
and seeing how they work in the long term. And we've changed our designs to actually make systems more robust and reliable. Maintenance is also very important. You'll have people tell you that things are maintenance free. I've never really encountered anything which is maintenance free in the engineered water cycle. There's always some level of maintenance. Now, what's great about passive and low input wastewater treatment systems is that they have very low levels of maintenance compared to some technologies. Like our company at the moment, uh, as I speak to you, I've got people running reverse osmosis treatment plants, ozone disinfection systems, ion exchange media. The amount of maintenance that those systems require compared to say an open bottom sand filter or a willow evapotranspiration system or a uh, Wisconsin mound, yeah, is incredibly high compared to these uh, forms of passive and low input wastewater treatment. But it doesn't mean that there's no maintenance involved at all, right? And for the system to maintain its performance and its water quality over time, it's just as essential that the maintenance is done on the passive and the low input wastewater systems as it is on the highly mechanical one. Now, when designed properly, you can get really good, reliable water quality treatment. And how do we know that? Well, one of the things that ARIS does is run the Handorf accreditation facility, which is done under the Australian standard 1546. For those of you in America, it's an NSF accreditation facility or, or similar. It's testing both mechanical treatment plants and passive and low input wastewater treatment plants against a standard. So we've been able to have a look at how these systems go from a variety of manufacturers and a variety of different design schools of thought or philosophy, if you like. And yeah, we've seen passive and on-site wastewater treatment systems get secondary, advanced secondary, and tertiary water quality. So it's all possible. The movement of water, only thing that moves water uphill is money. You give me enough money and I'll get you a flushing toilet on the top of Mount Everest, right? Don't really know why you'd need one, but yeah, to, to make water go uphill, you need money. Where we're installing these systems out in the real world, we very rarely get perfect sites where we can stage a treatment chain or a dispersal system down the, the slope of the land and the water flow is always going our way. Quite often we need to move water somewhere, quite often it's up a slope, and that may mean that pumps are required. If pumps are required, keeping in mind if we're going for energy efficiency, they can be solar, um, it's entirely possible. Connected to mains power is still more prevalent here in Australia. But even on gravity-based systems, what we found is that if you just let water flow into a tank and flow out into a sand filter or flow out into a soil-based system with no control on it whatsoever, you don't get as good performance out of that system as if it's intermittent dosing of water and you go through wetting and drying cycles. So this little animation here is a dosing siphon so that rather than the water just flowing from that pipe out through that pipe. As it comes in, it goes out. We're going through a wetting and dosing cycle. Now that dosing siphon, it can dose into an evapotranspiration bed. It can dose into a Wisconsin mound. It can dose into a sand filter. It doesn't really matter what's on the other end of this pipe, but what it's doing is making sure that the system that it's dosing into is not getting adversely impacted by hydraulic surges or peak flows, and that the soil media, the sand media, the fabric filter, whatever it's going into is allowed to go through wetting and drying cycles. That wetting and drying cycle is really important. It changes your oxygen conditions. It helps your beneficial microorganisms to grow. And um, yeah, if you're doing this with a pump, um, yeah, rather than just running your pump off a float, having a pump controller so that your pump controller is activating and dosing in two minutes every hour, 24 hours a day, really depends on your flow rate into your tank. But yeah, rather than just having a float on a submersible pump that puts a thousand liters every time that it's triggered, micro dosing with timed intervals, you'll get much better performance out of the same treatment system at the end. 
So that's basically what a dosing siphon looks like. It's just constructed out of PVC. So it converts a small irregular flow into a calibrated dose of uniform distribution, really low capital cost, very little maintenance, no moving parts, no requirements for electrical power. And people have been using dosing siphons for over 100 years. Uh, there's flouts as well. Uh, depending on the pressures, you can actually set them up onto sequencing valves such as K-Rain valves. Uh, so you can even use them to, to trigger uh, more even distribution. So why is distribution a problem? Well, this is what can occur if you get it wrong. So we've got a really chunky pipe here on the right. So total suspended solids in the water was high. The pipe basically clogged up over time. Now, these are two different sites. This is a Wisconsin mound that had failed and it had actually failed up at that far end up there. But what you can tell, if you have a look, this system was about 10 years old. And you can see some black material and everything that it had clogged up that end. But this end up here had never really received any water over that 10 years at all. That sand to me looks pretty much as fresh as the day that the Wisconsin mound went in. But because of the distribution problem, this area up here, it never got the water. So it failed up that end. You can see that there's a surge out that side, that green grass compared to all the, the, the die off area there, that there was surface flow and pooling. Yeah, the water got to that far and never wanted to go any further. It went to surface pooling out to that side. And there was all this area that needed to be used. Well, it was supposed to be used as part of the initial design, never got used because there was a distribution issue tied to gravity flow. So distribution of water is essential in these low input and passive systems. Um, so the, making sure that even distribution uh, occurs can mean the difference between success and failure of your design. So another way of putting this is rather than just using part of your sand filter or mound or uh, zeolite filter or however you're looking at disposing of the, uh, dispersing the water, you wanna use all of it rather than just part of it. So yeah, we're big believers in dosing, making sure you're either pumping or dosing siphon so that you're getting all of your media used. Um, now this purple tunnel here was designed by Tim Woods. He's one of Australia's leading onsite and decentralized wastewater plumbers and he's also got an environmental or well, masters in environmental health degree and he has spent tens of thousands of hours working on this distribution issue and uh, he's invested an awful lot of his own money like this is a, a mold that he's developed up and if you have a look here what he's looking at doing rather than just having a curved tunnel at the top he worked out that if you've got a flat part along the top and you're pumping up and you're hitting that flat part, you get a much more even distribution of the water across the gravel layer there at the bottom. And you also went down into the droplet size. And if you're going with your droplets as it falls through the air gap there, um, you're aerating your water, but it's being done passively, right? There's no blower, there's no compressor. Uh, that water's being well, can either be pumped through or put through with a dosing siphon or a flout. Um, yeah, so it's the movement of the water, goes up, hits the flat surface, forms a, a, a micro drop of water, which aerates. And he's also worked out with this tunnel, you can actually, and there's a photo coming up further on in the slides, you can put a whirly bird at either end of the tunnel. And that will is a passive form of making sure that you've got plenty of oxygenated air within that tunnel. He also worked out if you put the pipe up on the trivets there and elevate it, you don't need to put in your root intrusion chemicals, right? It's not sitting down there. No root is actually ever going to wrap itself around that pipe because it's suspended in air. So it's a, another form of, of reducing down the chemical consumptions or the operational costs of this type of treatment technique. Now this type of tunnel, it can go on a vapotranspiration bed, it can go on a sand filter, it can go in a 
uh, a Wisconsin mound, it can go into a, a media bed, it can go into a rhizopod, which I'll talk about a little bit later. It's a whole range of things that it can go into. And um, yeah, it, it's an interesting type of uh, technological advance. And it looks simple, but it took 10, 20 years of trial and error to, to get this right. Uh, another thing that he's done to make sure that you get even distribution, and I'll talk about that on another slide, is actually the diameter and the spacing of these holes. So if we're talking about uh, the distribution of water, if we move into septic tanks and constructed wetlands, this can be described as preventing hydraulic short circuiting. So you want the water to slow down and walk as it goes through your septic tank or it goes through your constructed wetland. Where we've done some testing on hydraulic retention time in septic tank designs at the Handel facility that I've mentioned there before, um, hydraulic short circuit in the tank uh, actually meant that one tank we tested there was with a dye test, the water was only staying within the tank for six minutes before it got to the outlet of the tank. Now, the, the volume of the tank indicated that there should be 24 hours retention time within it, but the pipe work had created a sh hydraulic short circuit. So rather than 24 hours retention time within the septic tank, yeah, it was less than 10 minutes. So that's less than ideal. And that's the other thing, you know, also what you want to do with your constructed wetland, rather than having an inlet here and an outlet there, you want to S curve it. You want baffles and um, hydraulic, walls within your uh, constructed wetland to slow that water down so that uh, it can't just enter in and just as quickly enter out. So yep, yeah, your distribution method can be used to aerate the water as I've discussed there. That can be really important for your nutrient transformation, particularly if you're looking at nitrogen. If you're looking at nitrogen uh, reduction, you're typically chasing anaerobic conditions, anoxic conditions, anaerobic conditions, all within the one treatment system or the one treatment chain. So that's important. Anaerobic treatment. So septic tanks, retention time that I just mentioned there before. So this here is actually an anaerobic baffled reactor, which is a multi-baffled septic tank. So a single septic tank, you just look on this side here, you've got the scum on the top. Strangely enough, we call it a clear water zone in the middle, although I've never really considered it to be overly clear in the middle of a septic tank and you've got your sludge at the bottom. So what we do with an anaerobic baffled reactor is we put in multiple baffles. So we're trying to use gravity, which is passive, works for free, um, to reduce down our total suspended solids as much as possible. And if you think about it, it's also very difficult to have a hydraulic surge through a tank with this many baffles, right? Each one of these is gonna slow it down. So you get less scum at the top, less sludge at the bottom. So the, by the time you get to the end chamber, you've got as clear a water as you possibly can. So your BOD has gone down, your total suspended solids has gone down. And this is you know, a really robust and reliable treatment method of, of a primary treatment method, right? At the end of this, you can put in anaerobic filters. So at the end, you can have a dosing siphon or a pump in this last chamber, pump through an anaerobic filter. Um, so Professor Lawrence Gill and Dr. Muhammad Ali have been doing a lot of work with these AVRs and anaerobic filters out of the Trinity College Dublin. Dr. Muhammad Ali's got a really interesting project at the moment. Now, normally septic tanks and uh, AVRs, they're all vented. Uh, and what comes out of the vent is typically methane. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali's just started up a uh, project which has got a, a biofilter with beneficial microbes growing on, on it that converts the methane into carbon dioxide, which is a much less uh, aggressive, let us say, or potent greenhouse gas than methane. So yeah, there's even things that you can do to take an already passive or low input treatment technique and to make it even better. So, or, or make it uh, it's greenhouse gas emissions even less. So that's an interesting research project going on there. So sand filters. So here's some of this purple tunnel. What I was talking about with the distribution method there before, you can see how it's even across the top of that distribution method there. 
Um, and the whole reason it's even is what Tim worked out, well, he, he basically just applied some really old Greek mathematics is if you're drilling holes along the top of the pipe, if the holes that you drill are less than the diameter of your pipe, you get even distribution across the length of the pipe. If you drill too many holes along the top or the holes are too big and they exceed the diameter of the pipe, you will get uneven distribution across that uh, field. So we actually have competitions amongst ourselves as to, yeah, the, the squirt height and how even it is across the distribution. I suppose we're weird because of that, but um, yeah, it's really old mathematics. It's the, su such old mathematics that it was discussed by uh, ancient Greek philosophers, you know, best part of 3000 years ago. But sadly, we seem to have forgotten it. And, uh, but if you apply it into things such as sand filters, Wisconsin mounds, ETA beds, you get a much better performance because you're evenly distributing your water over the entire area. So um, yeah, it can be the difference between uh, failure and uh, success. Sand filters, a big thing with sand filters is you've got to make sure that your sand specification is right. It's a Goldilocks performance, right? If it gets too fine, um, you don't get your water go through. You get a black biomass and it clogs and you get surface pooling. If it's too coarse, it goes through too rapidly and you don't get your retention time within your sand filter and you don't get the treatment that you're chasing. So yeah, a whole reason why a lot of people think that sand filters fail or that they're, they're, they're not a, a good technology is that they haven't put the time into making sure that the sand that they're constructed from is right. And we've known for decades exactly what type of sand we're chasing. Um, it, it's just that people tend to use what was available at the nearest quarry rather than taking the time during the design phase to and uh, the build phase to make sure that the correct sand has been specified. Uh, but sand filters, we're getting excellent performance out of them. And uh, yeah, the can be run with the pump and the controllers or the dosing siphons, as I've mentioned there before. And if you want to actually lower the footprint of a sand filter, you can make it recirculating like this one is here. So this purple tunnel down the bottom through there, it's a line sand filter. So the media bed's built on top. Yeah, if you're chasing advanced secondary or even getting up into your tertiary, if you're looking to harvest the water from your sand filter to reuse, like Dendra said before, uh, wastewater is an archaic or a, a, a dinosaur term. Every time I use it, there's a, a Dr. Jennifer Saunders rears a, in, in the back of my mind, she used to give out dinosaur eggs to everybody who uh, mentioned the term wastewater rather than treated water or recycled water. Um, yeah, you can definitely adapt your passive and low input systems so that uh, you can recirculate, get a desired water quality, produce a recycled water. Um, just keeping in mind that if you are doing this, typically you do require a pump because it's quite difficult to, well, gravity dose back up to the top of the filter. So in these type of situations, you're talking more low input systems rather than pure passive. Um, open sand filters, so if the liner wasn't there and just going into the natural soil down below, in that situation, you're talking about your treatment system and your dispersal system all being in the one location. So, so a self-contained and recirculating evapotranspiration channel, uh, marketed in Australia as the Rhizopod system. This was my master's technology and I uh, started this research back in 1998. Uh, done in tropical Australia, we have done it in uh, temperate Australia, has a pretreatment system, typically a septic tank or an ABR. Majority are configured as no release. So what this is, is, yeah, I'll show you a picture. So, household here or a commercial situation there, treatment system, septic tank. Uh, we've got a balance tank there, which is a wastewater treatment. Uh, well, it, it, yeah, typically has a pump in it, can have a dosing system. Rather than a blower for aeration, the pump's got a Mazzy Venturi valve on it. The water's pumped through. You, this one, we're growing bamboo and a series of tropical plants. It's a contained system for use in sites with 
um, environmental issues, such as on the Great Barrier Reef, you're above a groundwater drinking bore. Um, the soil is very unsuitable. It's a heavy clay. So yeah, those type of situations. So none of the wastewater can be released to the environment. So this is with a plastic pod through there. It's got a small footprint because it recirculates. So it's unusual in regards to these passive and low input systems because yeah, it, it's got a relatively small footprint, whereas typically they're larger. Uh, in Australia, yeah, we're installing them on islands, out on the Great Barrier Reef, coastal locations, people who've got groundwater drinking balls on their site, which could possibly be contaminated. And um, yeah, that type of thing. So there's one actually out in a location near the Great Barrier Reef, it's got bamboo there. This is a caravan park or an RV park. Um, it's 20,000 litres a day uh, being done in a, a no release, low input system. Can there be issues with passive and low input systems? Of course they can. Um, just because we're talking about a low input treatment system doesn't automatically mean good. Systems can be designed or installed incorrectly, as I've mentioned a few times there before, such as using the wrong grade of sand and a sand filter, a cesspool is a form of a passive or low input system. And Dendra, who's on our panel today, she's living on the big island in Hawaii. They've got a huge problem with cesspools at the moment. They've got around 90,000 cesspools which have been installed, which are just charging around 200 megalitres of wastewater per day across the islands. And one cesspool or two cesspools, uh, that can actually be beneficial to public health compared to no sanitation. But where you've got you know, them in the tens of thousands in a relatively small area, discharging into aquifers, coastal uh, uh, estuaries, it does cause a problem. Now, they're aiming to replace all of those cesspools uh, by the year 2050, with the high priority ones done by the year 2030. Uh, but it's caused such an issue that community groups such as Wastewater Alternatives and Innovation have formed to help the homeowners deal with the transition from cesspools to another form of treatment. And a lot of the forms of treatment that they're looking at are low input and passive um, because that's what people are used to on the island and there's skill shortages. Um, but some mechanical solutions are gonna be needed as well. Uh, website for wastewater alternatives of innovation is there. You can have a look at what's going on, um, but it's not something that I was particularly aware of some you know, five years ago, but with uh, Dendra moving to the island and making us aware, yeah, it's, a, it, it's an issue where, uh, yeah, a, a passive form of treatment or minimal treatment or no treatment or wastewater management, such as a cesspool, is causing a, a major issue in a modern location. Are there many learning opportunities as far as on site wastewater uh, passive and low input systems are? Yes, there are. So the Australian Water School's got a, uh, a course coming up. University of Minnesota's got plenty of information. Wastewater Education that Dendra runs also does. The Australian Water Association's got the Regional Rural and Remote Specialist Network. Massachusetts Alternative Septic Test Centre's got plenty of case studies up on their website. NARA, which is the, the main uh, industry group in uh, the United States has got a huge amount of resources available. So do the Canadian on-site wastewater associations such as the Alberta one there. There's lots of R&D going on in uh, universities across the world such as the Texas A&M University there and the Trinity College Dublin uh, there as well. So there's plenty of information available. Mind you, it can be quite difficult to find just with a Google search. So the IWA conference coming up in uh, Perth later on this year is actually specialising in on these passive and low input systems with uh, a focus on what's suitable for developing countries. I know we've had a lot of questions about this uh, in the lead up to the webinar so, and the abstracts for this conference uh, close on the 15th of July. So if you're an academic who's researching in this area or a consultant and you want to get your viewpoint across, please put in an abstract. And I'll just leave the conclusion there because Jacqueline's giving me an evil eye that my time is coming to an end and we want to get into these questions. So 
I will stop sharing and we'll start getting into the questions. And hopefully Dendra has been uh, having a look through these as they get posted up and uh, it has got some to, to go on with. Dendra. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Anne. This was an excellent presentation, gave, gave us the pros and cons, some examples, and also your resource list at the end is, is really very useful. Yeah, I'm just handing this uh, to uh, Dendra to go through the Q&A and then open it to the floor as well. So over to you, Dendra. Sure. Um, one of the questions that actually just came in, uh, what about the impact on microbial pollution? What about drug residue, hormones, et cetera? So maybe Ben, you would like to address that? Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns in this area at the moment as far as drug uh, impacts. One of the things there is a CRC, which has just started up in Australia. And uh, for the first time, we're going to be really intensively looking at antibiotic resistant microbes and the impact of um, pharmaceuticals. We're going to be comparing the, uh, the removal and the occurrence of these types of microbes between mechanical wastewater treatment systems and passive and low input systems. Now we're just in the stage of designing um, those uh, experiments. Natalie's actually working on part of the literature review for, for that at the moment. So yeah, it's a, a keen area of interest and uh, there's not an awful lot out there at the moment, but we hope over the next couple of years, we'll have a, a good bit of research data and we'll publish and, and share all that information with everybody. There seems to have been a lull in that because many years ago when Herb Buxton was in charge of the R&D at USGS, um, they did a lot of work on antibiotic resistance and developing testing for comparing what came out of on-site systems versus what came out of central treatment plants. So, so it was a concern then and it certainly is now. The, but, the last time I seriously researched it was back in 2005 and I was looking at uh, what was in medical clinics in rural and remote areas. So on-site systems and that type of stuff. And yeah, we found lots. So we found heaps of MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and uh, vancomycin resistant Enterococci. So 93% of systems tested positive for either one of those. And yeah, over 80% tested positive for both. And yeah, was a little bit freaky. So yeah, they're definitely there. Yes, suggestion to the organizer, this, that's an event in itself, you know, because it uh, depends really what, what they are, if they're organic based or inorganic based. And even back then, it was proven that certain of these substances can combine to create something even worse. So, uh, let me go back to the answered questions here before we move on to the others. Um, one of the questions was, can we combine stormwater harvesting systems with passive and low input systems? And some of the answers there were, um, and one of the things I brought up was the one water concept. Yep. That, yeah, you, you can't yeah. separate stormwater, drinking water, wastewater. It's yep. all one water. So In Australia, it's quite often termed water sensitive urban design. It's got different terminology uh, uh, across the world. A lot of the same principles we're talking about. We're wanting to slow that water down, uh, increase our hydraulic retention time, use a lot of natural processes. So a, a lot of the things are, are the same. Um, yeah, there is a big drive to make sure that our uh, domestic wastewater and industrial wastewater is keeping separate from our storm water because once you start mixing them together, you get all of the issues that the United Kingdom's currently dealing with with the Thames and whatever. Uh, you know, I've listened to Fiegel Sharkey with a good heart is hard to find all through the 80s. And now he's out there campaign, campaigning against combined sewer overflows in the River Thames. So I suppose I'm still listening to him, but on a completely different topic. question about, um, it, there was a general one about do's and don'ts when you're designing this. I think you 
covered that really in your presentation. Uh, what yes. about treatment of industrial and commercial waste going through a passive or a low impact system? Yeah, it very much can be done, but you've got to get your inflow chemistry data and your flow data. So the way that wastewater is generated with an industry or a commercial site is very different to domestic. Domestic, you've got your morning surge, you've got your evening surge. Um, depending on what you're doing in, in the industry or the commerce, your wastewater will actually arrive at your just, uh, treatment system in, in a different flow pattern but you can have vastly different chemistry as well. You can have lots of disinfectants in there or, or chemicals which will impede some of your natural processes. Your solids can be very different. So where we talk about fit for purpose and making sure that your design suits your application, it's incredibly important for those commercial and industrial situations because we've got the, um, yeah, your, your inflow chemistry will be vastly different. Question that occurred to me that I think it came up in one of them. Are these more suited to warm weather climates? I do recall several years ago doing a webinar called Love in a Cold Climate, the use of distributed water systems and sub in zero temperatures. That, um, yeah, but what about changes and fluctuations yeah. of temperature? I was bored enough to be reading a research article on ABRs, so the anaerobic baffled reactors there yesterday, and they were testing it, the performance at two different temperatures, so 25 degrees centigrade and 16 degrees centigrade, and the ABR had an impaired performance at the 16 degrees because the microbes weren't as active as what they were at the, the 25 degrees. So if you think your inflow uh, wastewater is going to be cooler, you actually need to increase the size of your ABR so you've got a longer retention time in there because your biomass isn't going to be as active. Um, but that impacts on mechanical systems as well. Uh, one of the things that we found from Handorf is where blowers are taking in cold air and blowing it into a mechanical aerated system. That actually did the same reduction in performance in a mechanical system as it does in a passive system because the air temperature was lowering the water temperature, which impeded those beneficial microbes. So temperature is incredibly important. Um, uh, so Dandra, so Dandra, so we have about three minutes left. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, we could maybe have one of the other panel members, each panel member pick a question they would like to answer. Um, so we can hear from them and their expertise. Um, maybe Richard, you have your... Uh, yeah, 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 Richard, you have your... Uh, uh, you're unmuted. Would you like to pick a question and you would throw your well, five cents worth in? I think Ben's just answered the one with respect to commercial systems, which is what we do deal with. It does depend a lot on the chemistry of the influence. And so that question's already been answered, which is the one I was going to look at. Would Natalie like to answer a question? Uh, yeah, I guess I can answer the question uh, from Sean about local governments. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Some people, and specifically governments, uh, they're not familiar with a system and how it works and the effectiveness of it, they can be very reluctant to consider new things. Um, but this is where um, using data and evidence from, you know, systems such as what we've implemented in different locations can make those changes. So like any government systems and processes, they can be challenging, but that's where, you know, it's important to use the information from companies like Aris and, and provide that data to help them understand how these are beneficial systems. Yeah, that sounds uh, like an excellent answer. Um, thank you all. You know, um, 
In my experience, I've noticed that, uh, and thank you, Ben, for this excellent presentation, but in my experience, I've noticed that uh, the lower key the uh, systems are and the more uh, natural um, elements they contain, like plants and so forth, people um, kind of think, uh, you know, they put these things in place and then they walk away. And you mentioned that very well. All of you really uh, highlighted the need for maintenance and ongoing. And so changing the language of some of these more naturally based systems or lower key systems into the capital asset uh, language is probably a uh, very um, important. So talking about, uh, you know, the commissioning phases and uh, talking about them, the asset maintenance plan, because it becomes an asset. And uh, so many times we see uh, some of the wet ends and even for polishing uh, work, you know, just uh, left on uh, to their own devices and deteriorating with the result that people say, oh, they don't work <laughs> rather than saying they haven't really been maintained up to the spec they needed to be. So I think these were some really good messages there. So that um, was an excellent presentation. And thank you very much for your contributions. And also thank you very much for the uh, to the audience for their questions. I think there are a, a lot of questions that haven't been um, asked. But um, now just a, a message to the audience. Now you have uh, the people's uh, contact details. Uh, you can listen to these uh, the recording, you can see the slides, and, and that should come up uh, fairly soon. And so we have our last slide here. So if you would like to um, get a certificate for certificate of attendance, you can just um, get that uh, scan that QR code. And also, uh, there will be a pop up of a, a last minute survey. Um, to answer you, you know the questions of how how did it go with the webinar, uh, how did you find it, uh, and so forth, and also um, just as a highlight of what's coming up soon uh, from the Australian Water School, there is a whole list of webinars, um, you know, with some interesting titles. What's mud got to do with it? So, so anyways, look on the uh, look on our website and find those webinars. Uh, the webinars are free, and then uh, they lead into some courses. Sign up for the course if you want to un have answers for more detailed questions and uh, dive a bit more into the design aspects of those uh, low input systems and low key systems, wastewater systems. So um, without uh, more to say on, uh, on this note, I think I'll wait for uh, the survey to pop up and uh, I'll thank you all, the speakers, everybody who attended. Um, thank you very much, and I'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you.